Yesterday afternoon, I was at the YMCA and I ran into my classmate, Carrie, and she reminded me of what I had posted on my Facebook because I had said, went to the doctor. The doctor said it would be good to lose some weight. But then I thought about what the bishop said. We are all temples of the Holy Spirit. And why should I be a chapel when I could be a basilica? <laughs> you know, every time, once in a while I write a homily, and I get down here and I'm in the confessional, and then I read it and I just go, oh, that stinks. <laughs> Today we celebrate what? Christ. Priest of Christ the King. I'm wearing the white, and it's a symbol of Christ and his place, his rightful place as King of the universe. Well, there are a lot of things that could be said about Christ the King, but the first thing that came to mind was a feast we celebrated just this past week. Feast of San Miguel Agustin Pro, who was martyred in 1929 in Mexico. Why? Because he was a Catholic priest who did what a Catholic priest does. He offered Mass. He offered the sacraments. And for that, he was killed. Why? Because in, in Mexico, in the 1920s, they elected an atheist. And the atheistic president put basically out in law, you will not celebrate Mass publicly. You will not dress as priests publicly. You will not celebrate the sacraments, period. And that was what was going on in Mexico back in the 1920s. But there was Miguel, a, Jes uh, a Jesuit. And what he would do, he would go dressed up in regular civilian clothing, go into people's homes and celebrate masses. He would hear confessions and he would participate in the sacraments until one day someone found him out and reported him to the police. So they brought him forward with the usual superfluous, unnecessary, whatever it was, the, the lack of justice in that time, basically brought him straight to a firing squad. And they called in the, the newspaper, who, you know, had one of those brand new things called cameras. And they, they took a picture. And they were hoping, the military was hoping to get this quivering little ball of bawling priesthood uh, begging for his life. But what they got was a man who stood there and said, go ahead. And he put out his arms like this and across and said, Viva Pistore. Anybody know what that means? Live, live on Christ. Long live Christ the King. That was the battle cry in Mexico in the late 1920s. There was a great battle that almost nobody knows about. It was formed by people who were defending their right to worship Christ the King. So their battle cry was, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. And they would say, Y Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, and Our Lady of Guadalupe. And that was their battle cry. That was their bumper sticker. And this all revolves around the relationship that we should have with Christ the King. The people in Mexico were dying. There are many martyrs from the 20s that we celebrate today. Some of them have recently been canonized. Some were canonized maybe in the 80s, but a lot in the last five or 10 years. People who gave their lives, people who died for their faith, died for their king rather than live quietly underneath an oppressive government that took away their religious freedom. It is important for us to recognize what we have. I talked to many Hispanic, many Mexican seminarians, and there is still the residual. It's a Catholic country, but there's still that residual, how would you say it, that the priests still many times don't wear clerics because of what happened because of what happened to their grandfathers. And the army that they formed was not what you would call a good army. It was a bunch of farmers, a bunch of peasants, who were short on bullets, but big on courage. 
they came in and they put up a great fight. They put up a fight that helped change the direction of Mexico. And at the greatest point in the history of the Cristeros movement, they had 40 to 50,000 soldiers, and 99% of them had never held a gun before. They were just peasants, farmers, and they defended many to the death. Their right, their privilege to worship Christ the King. And that should give us pause. What challenges are facing us today in this country that assault our religious freedom? Has anybody ever heard of the Hobby Lobby? They have a lawsuit against the government because they provide insurance for their own employers. And the government is saying, you must provide insurance that is repugnant and repulsive to your faith. You have to provide insurance that requires you to provide contraceptives, abortifacients, and things that are against your religion, because we say so. And we have a nation right now that is reeling from those who want to see the First Amendment upheld. Faith, freedom of religion, and that is being assaulted. It's being chipped away. It's kind of like a little frog in the water. We'll turn it up a little bit here, and we'll turn it up a little bit there, and eventually, the little frog is toasted. And that's kind of what's happening in our country today. And we can see what happened in Mexico 80 years ago. The, the, the president of that country went from one side to the other and the people revolted. But in this country, it's happening slowly. One little thing here, well, it doesn't affect me personally, so I'm just going to let it go. Well, it's not that big of a deal. So we'll just let it slide because of all these other good things. But I can assure you that when something comes up that is intrinsically evil, there is nothing and no circumstance that can make it okay. For example, direct procured abortion is never okay. It's intrinsically evil. And all of those words are important. Direct procured abortion. A natural abortion is not an intrinsic evil. That's called a miscarriage. An indirect abortion is not necessarily an intrinsic evil. Indirect abortion would be something where someone says, okay, I'm pregnant, I've got cancer. Well, the person can receive chemotherapy knowing that it's going to kill the infant, but the mother might survive. It's legitimate. It's plausible to have an indirect abortion. That's not intrinsically evil. But what's happening in our country today, like what was happening in Mexico, is that many things are under attack. And so we need to look to the king. Now, we don't really connect very well with kings because we don't have them here. But I would argue that the best government is not a democracy. It is a monarchy. Now, I'm not saying that we want one in this country. Don't get me wrong. What is a monarchy? It is a king who is ruling and governing and whatever the king says goes. So what needs to happen to have a good monarchy? You have to have a holy king. The only truly holy king we have is Jesus Christ. The only truly holy governance that we can have is one that is based on Jesus Christ and what he taught. No president, no parliament, no democracy can fully manifest the benefits and the fruits of having a divine leader. That would be called a theocracy, a, a government that is focused on God. And that is what we ascribe to. That is what the founders of this country believed in. They believed in a country that had a separation of church and state. And the biggest misunderstanding understanding about the separation of church and state is that people want to claim that the church has absolutely nothing to say about the governance of this country. That is the biggest load of bull and the biggest lie that you will ever hear. The church has much to say. The church is there to inform the conscience morally and ethically. The church is there to guide us, to tell us 
to help inform us so that we know in this given instance, based on what we know about what is good and what is true, we know what is good and right. Pilate was sitting there struggling. What is true? What is true? Jesus saying, I have come to testify to the truth. Pilate ignored it and sent an innocent man to be executed. He ignored the truth, the reality of the truth. The separation of church and state was put there to protect the government from religion. In that we will not and we will never have a state religion. In other words, no one religion will control the government. And that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. That's the separation of church and state that the founding fathers intended. Because they had come from Europe. And every single place, whether it was a king or a president, well, who's the king? Well, that's their religion. Whatever the religion of the king is, that's what everybody else had. It was kind of like the flavor of the month. You just take whatever they give you. But in this country, they're saying, no, freedom of religion means that it needs to be separated in its practice from the government. But that does not mean that what religion teaches has nothing to do with how we govern. If our government is not educated by the truth, and there is only one, Jesus Christ, if it is not guided by that, it is guided by a balance of powers. It is guided by a misunderstood balance of truth, where it devolves into this thing we call relativism. Relativism says, well, that may be true for you, but I have my own truth over here. And that's not true, because I love to throw this question out to the kids. Sometimes I say, well, there's, you know, there's, truth, truth is relative and there's no absolute truth. Okay, that's been thrown around a lot. So, can you say that for sure? Yes, I can say for sure that there is no absolute truth. So you're saying it's your truth, your absolute truth statement is saying that there is no absolute truth. That doesn't work. There is absolute truth. That's what we find in the gospel today. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the answer to all of the confusion in the world today that we are suffering from. This relativism that says, well, you can do those things, but I'm not going to. Because it might be true for you, but it's not true for me. And so we are content as a society to sit back and to let other people do intrinsically evil things under the guise of, well, it's just, just their way of doing things. When in fact we need to be defending what is good and what is true and what is holy and what is right. How do we do that? Well, we come to Mass. You all know that. That's very important. We come to confession. We read the scriptures. We read the catechism. Those things instruct us and tell us what is good and what is true. But that's not enough. There is much more to the truth of Jesus Christ. And that truth of Jesus Christ is found on our knees in humility. We humble ourselves before our God and say, what is it that you teach? Because what the Lord teaches us is often very hard to accept. So today, we come before the Lord, the King of the universe, the Sovereign King. The King that tells us, that not only tells us the truth, but is the truth. And so we ask God to guide us today to be aware of the fullness of that truth, wherever it may be, and to live that truth regardless of the consequences. Because if we humble ourselves before the King in this age, we will be exalted with him for all eternity in heaven.